It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thanks very much, Speaker. My first question this morning is for the Premier. Why has uh, this Premier and his government failed beyond belief to prepare for the second wave of COVID-19, even though everybody knew it was coming? And why are they now doing so little to mitigate its impacts? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Leader of the Opposition for the question. In fact, we have done a significant amount to prepare for a second wave. We've been working on this throughout the summer months, knowing that a second wave would be coming, more complicated to deal with than the first wave, because we also have flu season approaching. We also have several hundred thousand uh, cases of procedures and surgeries that were postponed during the first wave that now must be addressed. And we have diminished capacity in some of our hospitals because of the necessary decanting of patients from long-term care homes into hospitals for infection prevention and control. But we do have a six-pronged plan that is to dealing with all of these issues, which is building on the initiatives that we started since the beginning of COVID-19, but wrapping, ramping up our uh, capacity significantly in dealing with all of the issues Once. that I've just mentioned. We are ready for wave two and we are dealing with it. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, unfortunately, the Premier and his ministers are about the only ones that believe they are actually stepping up to the plate and dealing with the second wave, wave appropriately. Public health experts around Ontario, doctors, uh, uh, people who work in long-term care, those frontline workers, long-term care home operators. Sick kids hospitals, hospitals all around the province, everybody is saying that this government needs to do much, much more than it's been doing. When is the Premier going to start listening to experts that are outside his inner circle and stop cutting corners and trying to save a buck at the expense of public health and take real action to fight COVID-19? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, in fact, the uh, fall preparedness plan was informed by significant consultations with outside people, including 45 consultations with over 300 experts in health. It's also been informed by our Chief Medical Officer of Health and all of the public health experts that are around the public health table that have been giving advice to us on what we need to do. We've done that. We have prepared for all of those issues in our plan, and we have put significant money into amping up our resources, including over a billion dollars into enhancing our testing, tracing, and, and isolating capabilities. So we have both the experts' advice and we have put the money into the plan, and the plan is being worked on and being implemented as we speak to deal with COVID-19 and the second wave. The final supplementary. Well, uh, Speaker, stronger measures to uh, mitigate and fight back against the COVID-19 uh, second wave are happening across Canada. Is the Premier prepared today to invest the money necessary to provide direct financial assistance, direct financial support to businesses and individuals that will allow Ontario to fight the virus while at the same time providing Ontarians the economic security that they need to, and that they deserve? Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And our government certainly recognizes the challenging times that are COVID-19 in, in this time of global uncertainty, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we announced on March 25th a total of $17 billion in direct supports for our health care system and people and small businesses throughout this great province. But, Mr. Speaker, as the pandemic uh, uh, progressed, we realized that that wasn't enough. And that's why in August, Mr. Speaker, our government committed a total of $30 billion. That's an increase of $7.3 billion for individuals and, and small businesses and job creators throughout this province. Mr. Speaker, these are uncertain times, but we know that the people of Ontario are strong and we will weather this storm together. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, the Ford government's uh, this next question is for the uh, Premier Speaker. Uh, the government's failure and this Premier's failure to properly prepare for a second wave is going to have the most devastating consequences in long-term care. Yesterday, two more residents died at the uh, West End Villa in Ottawa, bringing that death toll to 15 residents in that one long-term care home since August. Now, new outbreak rates, uh, outbreaks rather, in long-term care are, are up to 44. The Premier says he's listening to his experts. 
In a letter last week, long-term care operators, doctors, residents all warned that they were not ready, that long-term care was not ready, not prepared for the second wave of COVID-19. Who are the experts, Speaker, that are telling the Premier that long-term care homes are prepared for a second wave? Premier. Uh, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you who isn't an expert. The Leader of the Opposition isn't an expert because she's nowhere to be found for the last six months, as each and every one of us has been working 180 days every single day, 24-7. But I'll, I'll just uh, inform the Leader of the Opposition what we've done on the, on the second plan. We're hiring 3,700 more people in the health care sector, Mr. Speaker. We're putting a billion dollars towards tracing and testing throughout the entire province. We're putting $283.7 million for the backlog surgeries, and we're going to continue rolling out the support that the people of Ontario need. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, any time the Leader of the Opposition wants me to inform her on what's really going on in the province, I'd be more than happy to sit down with her. Thank you. A supplementary question. Well, again, Speaker, the Premier seems to be the only one that thinks his plan is working. In transcripts that were published yesterday from the government's own Long-Term Care Commission, the Long-Term Care Ministry makes it clear that proactive inspections of long-term care were not happening before the first wave of COVID-19 hit those long-term care facilities, even as the Ford government insisted that there was an iron ring around long-term care. Now, once again, the ministry is insisting that they're ready for a second wave, even as home operators, frontline workers, and residents and their families insist that they are not. The Premier says he listens to the experts. Who are the experts that are telling him that the second wave of COVID-19 is not going to be a problem in long-term care because they're ready for it? Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, we have never stopped working uh, since the planning began in February to make sure that our homes had every available resource for them during the first wave. This was a, a globally evolving pandemic in the first wave, but we know a lot more now. And if we look at the science, we understand about asymptomatic spread. We have the testing available. That was globally competed for in the first wave. The PPE supply is robust. And, and thank you to the Premier for all his efforts to revamp the procurement process. We are in a very different situation, and I remind people that an outbreak in long-term care can mean one staff member self-isolating at home, and that is the majority of our situation right now in outbreaks. It is one staff member, so we are holding. Our homes are holding. Response. They are at the front lines. We will continue to pour every resource that we have into them to shore them up, supply them with the resources that they need all day, all night. Our Thank you very much. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, when it comes to uh, long-term care, it really is not clear at all who this government is listening to. The people who run the homes, uh, the people who maintain those homes, uh, the people who are families of residents who live in those homes are all saying the same thing. We are not yet ready for a second wave of COVID-19. That's what they are saying. They're pleading with this government, Speaker, to uh, get them some more capacity for things like infection control. Infection specialists is what they're looking for. They're looking for more funding to hire more physicians so that they'll be able to be on site to, to deal with outbreaks when they occur. They are being ignored by this government even as outbreaks spread uh, to residents and that residents actually are losing their lives again. So if the Premier is actually listening, listening to experts. Who are the experts? Who are the folks that are telling Question. this Premier that everything is kosher in long-term care in terms of a second wave? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the, uh, the question. There are lessons learned from the first wave. There is no doubt about that, and we have been listening to the sector on an urgent basis, understanding what their needs are. And again, some of these areas of concern were longstanding. The staffing issue, the capacity issues, and not only the capacity issues in long-term long care, but also in hospitals. And, and we have an integrated approach now with hospitals, with the IPAC uh, teams there. And this is an incredibly important aspect to understand how we work together 
to create a more robust support for our long-term care homes as we have more understanding of the virus, how it spreads, what measures and tools are evolving and emerging across the world. We've learned from other countries as well. So our experts, hundreds of them, we are listening to them, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, our Medical Officer Spons. of Health, Public Health Ontario. We will continue to listen to our sector, hear their concerns, and respond in an active way, which is exactly what we've been doing and will continue to do. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Speaker. Families in Ottawa have lined up since before dawn to try to get a COVID test, which has been hard already. But to make matters worse, the province said there needs to be a cap on testing and cut tests by 1,200 a day. In a memo sent by officials, quote, it says, the provincial lab system is not able to keep up with the significant volumes over the past few weeks. The memo goes on to say, Speaker, quote, the province has made it clear that until the lab system is able to adequately increase capacity, there needs to be a pause on any additional capacity added to testing with temporary reductions needed for some areas. Speaker to the Premier, which 1,200 parents and children Premier should go home without a test to meet this new cap you're imposing about who gets and doesn't get health care in Ottawa? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I want to be clear that the memo referred to in the uh, media and by the member here was not reviewed or approved by me, and I've been unequivocal since the beginning that there are no caps or limits on testing that is to be allowed. This is something that is being reviewed. There is going to be clarification that is going to be issued by Ontario Health after it has been reviewed by my office. But we've said from the outset of this pandemic that everyone who needs a test must be able to have access to a test, and that has not changed. But we have indicated last week that because of the vast number of people that are coming forward for testing, uh, we ha and despite the fact that we've included and increased our lab processing capabilities to over 40,000 tests per day, we still need to make sure that those people who must be tested, who need to go back to work, who need to who are asymptomatic but are working with long-term Care patients, for example, must be given priority. But the fact of the matter is that anyone who needs a test will still get a test. Thanks, Speaker. The minister just told us that there are no caps, but that's not addressing the frustration in Ottawa at the actual labs that have been backlogged for days. Melissa Conrad is a laboratory technician at the medical laboratory Eastern Esla site. She says her lab has been backlogged by thousands of tests. It's no wonder that local officials are now saying that because of the lab backlogs, there needs to be caps on testing. The Premier and his minister should stop blaming the labs and the frontline front healthcare workers like Melissa doing their utmost to test everything they can. But extending testing hours at Moody Drive Assessment Centre has been put on hold, and a second pop-up testing centre in Orleans was scrapped because of concerns about capacity. Why has this government speaker bungled testing and lab capacity so poorly that memos like this are even being sent out in the first place? Mr. Health. Well, in actual fact, what is happening is we are boosting both the testing capacity and the lab capacity significantly. That is part of our fall, our fall preparedness plan because we knew that there would be more people coming in to be tested because of concerns with flu season coming up as well, as people knowing that there's an increase in COVID-19 testing and they want to be tested too. So we are boosting both of those. We are putting a billion dollars, a billion dollars into increasing our ability to test to conduct the lab analysis and to do the case management afterwards. So all three of those are, have been boosted significantly, remembering, in fact, that we started at the beginning with 5,000 tests being able to be done per day. We're now at 40,000 tests being done today, and we're working to increase that to over 50,000 tests per day. That is part of our fall plan. That is what we have planned for. Response. That is what we've allocated money for, and that's what we're implementing. Thank you. The next question, the member for Markham, Unionville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, as you and the Minister of Health noted yesterday, numbers were deeply concerning. As our health officials have been telling us, Ontario is now in the second wave of COVID-19. We know that this wave will be more complicated, more complex. It will be worse than the first wave we faced earlier this year. As you indicated, there are two steps that everyone should take 
download the COVID alert app and get a flu shot this fall. But our government is taking additional measures to help strengthening our health care system. It means adding more resources, adding more testing capacity, and most importantly, adding more boots on the ground. As we enter the second wave, getting more health care workers, more nurses, more personal support workers. Premier, what's our Question. government's doing to bring additional resources as part of our four preparedness plan? Thank you, Mrs. The Premier to reply. I want to thank the, the great uh, member from Markham Unionville, second highest votes, second highest votes in the entire uh, province, so congratulations. <laughs> Together, our, our, our collective actions will decide whether, Mr. Speaker, if this is a wave or a tsunami, as I, as I mentioned yesterday. We've already taken countless steps to reduce uh, the gatherings, restrict gatherings, address hot spots across the, the province. And, and that's why, as I, I said earlier, Mr. Speaker, we're investing $283.7 million on the backlog of surgeries. We are put $1 billion into testing and tracing. We have the largest flu immunization uh, program ever seen in the entire country. That's 5.1 million flu shots, which I encourage each and every one of us to go out there and uh, Yet, Mr. Speaker, we're adding 800 more nurses, in total 3,700 more health care workers, 800 more nurses, Response. adding 600 more acute care nurses in hospitals and long-term care homes, over 2,000 more PSWs, which I love the PSWs. Great news coming on Thursday for them. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplemental question is to the Premier again. Premier, I want to echo your comments about the amazing work that our personal support workers do in the province. I want to take this opportunity to thank many of my constituents who are PSW, who have stepped up and sacrificed during this time. I am particularly proud of our government's announcement of additional funding of $14 million to the Personal Support Working Training Fund to continue training more PSWs for long-term care home and community care. These significant investments will allow us to recruit, retain, and quickly deploy our essential health workers to where they are needed most and ensure that our health care system is prepared to deal with any outbreaks or surges in cases. Speaker, Question. can the Premier please share with this legislature what other measures we have announced to get more boots on the ground prepare for the fall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Premier. Thank you. And again, I want to thank the MPP from Markham Unionville. We're sending out a call. We're sending out a call to the entire province for people to join the team. Out of the 3,700 people, Mr. Speaker, we need people. No matter if you're going to college or university, think about a career choice. A career choice would be great to step up to the plate and help our province out when we need you most. And Mr. Speaker, as part of our $52 million investment, $26 million is earmarked for so, uh, personal support workers and supportive care workers, and $26 million support the nurses. We're out there. We're asking the people of Ontario, please step up. I've got to give a shout out to all the great uh, volunteers that go into the long-term care homes to see their loved ones, that not only do they take care of their loved ones to take the, the load off the PSWs, but they take care of other patients within uh, long-term care. So I just want to give a shout out to all the great uh, family members uh, that go into long-term care to help out the PSWs. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Every day in this chamber, we've been asking the government to reduce class sizes so our children and staff can be properly distanced in our schools. I want to save the Premier some time here. We know what the Minister and the Premier have said over and over again, and it's the same plan that isn't working and that they've been talking about since the summer. The point is, Mr. Speaker, that plan, again, is not working. Ontario parents have lost confidence. Our cases are rising, so it's not good enough. Speaker, the Premier says they're listening to the voices of experts, but public health officials, hospitals, including sick kids, epidemiologists and experts have all said that smaller classes with more distance must be a priority. Why then, Mr. Speaker, are most classes in most boards just as crowded as they were before COVID-19? Who told this government not to adopt the advice of those experts? Mr. Education. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are following the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of this health of this province, the foremost medical expert of the province, who's given us advice on how to mitigate the spread and ultimately improve the safety of all schools. It's why, Speaker, we unveiled a plan that is funded with $1.3 billion in allocation, the largest investment in this country, to ensure our schools are safe. It's the basis for why school boards have now been able to hire well over 2,000 educators. It's the basis for why we have an additional 1,100 custodians. And, Speaker, that ex excludes some of the largest school boards as that data gets to the ministry. What we have seen is actions and layers of prevention being taken place in local school boards to reduce the risk. And, Mr. Speaker, we are grateful for the work of our educators, for the work of our public health, the work of our nurses and doctors in every school and every community of this province who are doing their very best to deal with this unprecedented Pons. pandemic. We are grateful for their leadership. We'll continue to be there for our schools. The supplementary question. Speaker, the Premier and the Minister just keep returning to those same speaking points over and over, but the truth is that the dollars are not flowing. Um, the government says they have a rainy day fund. Well, the rainy day is here. It's now. 30 grade fives in a portable is not acceptable to anyone else in this province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, I want to remind the government and others watching that this is the same government and the same cabinet that tried to increase class sizes to an average of 28 kids per class just months ago. This is the same government that wanted to cut 10,000 teachers and other education workers. And despite overwhelming evidence, despite surging cases, they still cannot bring themselves to do what needs to be done. So again, Mr. Speaker, Question. why won't the government deliver the one layer of protection that matters most, safely distanced smaller classes? Thank you. Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, we accept that it is uh, an unprecedented challenge, a rainy day, if you will, as used by the member opposite. It is curious, Speaker, that just weeks ago, when a proposal came from school boards to unlock $496 million of reserves, those members philosophically and fundamentally opposed it again. Shame. Just like, Shame. just Shame. like, Speaker, Order. just like they opposed online learning during the negotiations, just like they opposed online Order. learning in the fall. Speaker, consistency is a strength. What parents want is to know that their parliament is working very hard to ensure the quality of learning is consistent province-wide and it is safe. And that is exactly what this Premier is doing in every reach of this province, reducing classroom size, improving safety and ensuring quality of learning online and in class. Well, question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Um, Speaker, I think we all understand the economic imperatives that have governed the reopening of our communities, and we all understand that people are longing to get back to the activities that they love with their friends and their families. But, Mr. Speaker, at this moment, as we see the weaknesses in the reopening plan, as we hear health officials advising us to pull back and introduce new restrictions in restaurants and bars, as we hear the Ontario Hospital Association advising that in some regions we would be best to return to stage two in order to possibly continue to keep schools open, why is it that the government considers it necessary to allow casinos to open? Premier to reply. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the, the question from the, the former Premier. Uh, we do listen to the Chief Medical Officer of Health. That's who, that's who I listen to. That's who the team listens to. And it's not just about the Chief Medical Officer, Officer of Health. They have health experts that are sit around the health table and uh, not only advise us, but advise the Chief Medical Officer. So I'll continue to uh, listen to the Chief Medical Officer of Health. They seem to do one heck of a great job getting us to the point we are. I was looking at the map the other day, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, next to Illinois, uh, any region our size in all of North America, we're testing more people than any of them. We're, we're actually hammering with over 40,000 40, deaths. So we're, we're going to still be vigilant, and we won't take our eye off the ball for a second, but I do appreciate the, the question from the former Premier. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I appreciate the complexity of what the Premier is up against right now, Mr. Speaker. And I was actually thinking last night what I would do if I were in his shoes. And, Mr. Speaker, it does occur to me that comparisons with the United States is not the comparison that I would 
look to. I would actually look to some of those countries in other parts of the world. I would look to Scandinavian countries. I would look to what is happening in other parts of the world to inform what we're doing. And I would listen, as he says he is, to all of the health officials in Ontario. It's interesting, Mr. Speaker, that the Minister of Education doesn't seem to listen to frontline teachers, doesn't seem to listen to educators, and now, Mr. Speaker, we've got the Ontario Hospital Association putting out advice that doesn't seem to be uh, resonating with the government. So what the, what the OHA is saying, Mr. Speaker, is they're warning that, that, that if the government does not Question. move back to stage two in the regions of the province with the highest count, case counts, namely the GTA and Ottawa, hospitals could become overwhelmed with patients. Was the government aware that the OHA was going to make this recommendation? And if not, why not? Now that the recommendation has been made, will the government follow the advice of these health officials? Premier. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, again, I, I did speak to Anthony Dale, I think it was yesterday, I believe, and uh, got his advice. But again, I appreciate the advice, and I, 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 I take their advice a lot of times, and, but I pass that on to the, the chief medical officer. That who I'm going to listen to. I'm going to listen to the chief medical officer, the deputy uh, chief medical officer, and the, and the health team. That's what I'm going to have to do, and I know. The, the Premier would do exactly the same thing, former Premier, I should say, uh, would do the exact same thing. And she, she understands the, the pressures of, of this job. And you know something? I, I could never get up, up, upset with the former Premier because she's walked a mile in my shoes. She understands it. The next question, order. Member for Niagara West. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question s'adresse à la... Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of uh, Francophone Affairs. Last week was the, on, the day of uh, on, uh, on franco ontarian and this was an opportunity for us to talk about the needs of this community. What are the measures that were taken to continue to support the franco ontarian community? Minister of Fra Francophone Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my co-worker for his question and for all his work and his support for all the important stakes for uh, the Franco-Ontarian community. Last week, Mr. Speaker, we celebrated the Day of the Franco-Ontarians. And the week started very well with the adoption of, uh, of the 182 bill that recognized the Franco-Ontarian flag as an official emblem of the province of Ontario. Then we move forward with a $500 million investment for a promotion campaign for Franco-Ontarian uh, com companies. At the end of the week, I raised the flag for the uh, FAO and I made it possible to have a French accent on ID card of Ontario. We continue to work. I'm in constant consultation with the members of the Franco-Ontarian community to ensure that the government responds to their needs. Complimentary question. Thank you, Ms. Mrs. Minister, for your answer. As you mentioned, We've talked about, we, we have adopted uh, the French accent in the photo ID and uh, driver license. I was very happy to see this day. Can you talk about the importance of these measures uh, to our co-workers who are present here? Reply. Thank you to my co-worker for this question. Since we've been elected, we've heard the community, the Franco-Ontarian community asking for this uh, for this amendment. Between November 2019 and September 2020, we had 20 petitions about it. And the Franco Ontarian community was asking for it. And I'm very happy that this, uh, this measure was applied when the previous government was not able to do it in 15 years uh, of their term. And I was very happy to describe how important this measure was. The FAO said that this, is, this was a request that dated from, 19, from the 1980s. Franco-Ontarians have been asking for this change. 
Les Cote, the Cote de Jelina of this province will finally have their name written correctly on their photo ID. The member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is to the Premier. The Riverside, Bloor Court and Queen Street West BIAs represent over 600 businesses here in Toronto. They wrote an urgent letter asking for clarity around directives, financial support and relief from predatory insurance rates. When the Premier suddenly announced on Friday that they must reduce their hours of operation, they were blindsided. As the Premier lurches from one crisis to another, why would he not at the very least demonstrate some kind of respect for businesses who have been complying with public health directives instead of penalizing them for just trying to stay in business. At the very least, will this government try to help them survive with direct financial supports to ensure that they remain solvent? After all, it's not their fault that this Premier did not plan for COVID-19. Premier. Oh, Mr. Speaker, we, we've been there every step of the way. and. You know, some of my heart breaks for the, the restaurant owners. And, and by the way, I just got to tell the opposition, you can't have it both ways. You can't, in one question, say close down everything and, and listen to OHA, Ontario Hospital Association. And then the next, the next question is, why did you close down the, the bars and the restaurants an hour early? Like, you, you can't have it both ways. Order. But again, through the, uh, through the advice of the Chief Medical Officer, Mr. Speaker, uh, yes, we reduced the uh, restaurant and the uh, bars to, to close at 11 o'clock. I'm sorry, 12 o'clock, but they can have their last call at 11 o'clock. So you know something? I, I think it was very modest that uh, we asked the, the bars to close down and not stay open until 3 o'clock in the morning. We also uh, closed the, the, the strip joints, too, as well, because the transmission was 500 Spons. people versus 130 people at a restaurant. I support the restaurant uh, folks there, and we're going to come up with a plan with the federal government to support all the restaurants right across the province. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much. This Premier has been inconsistent on the business file. He just banned lap dances in strip joints last Friday, Mr. Speaker. The Premier says he understands how hard it is for our business community, but if he really did, he would be transparent with business owners about policies that will directly affect their bottom lines. Business owners need to know what is coming so that they can plan. The Toronto BIAs ask a good question. Does this government really know what they're doing? Because every move thus far has compromised confidence in our economy. They have one last request, which we also call for in our Save Main Street plan. Will this government take immediate action to work with the insurance industry to support SMEs by preventing, and, and the, uh, these are their words, astronomical increases to business insurance policies and premi premiums. If you want to be on the side of small businesses, Question. you should have their back on this file. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you, I, I just find it so ironic. Every single item that we've put forward over the last two years to reduce taxes by 8.75 percent in, in small businesses, reducing WSIB premiums by close to $2 billion, and I could go on and on and on. Mr. Speaker, the last speaker voted against every single item that we put forward to support small businesses. And I just find how they, they, they flip back and forth. I've never put one motion forward uh, that, for small businesses that they haven't disagreed with. So the, they, they're anti-business, and make no mistake about it, they're anti-business. They believe in taxing the pants off small businesses. We don't. We believe in supporting small businesses, small family-run businesses, and our policies have shown that we're going to continue supporting Spons. them. But you can't have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, after weeks of hearing that the government has a plan for a second wave of COVID-19, after weeks of promises to improve and increase testing capacity in Ottawa, after weeks of seeing those lines for tests in Ottawa get bigger and bigger and bigger, Mr. Speaker, the residents of the nation's capital awoke this morning to the news that the Ontario government has directed testing centres to reduce the number of tests they perform and to stop the expansion of testing centres like the one on Moody Drive uh, in Nepean. According to the reports, there isn't enough lab capacity to process the tests, Mr. Speaker, and the government has asked for fewer tests to be done. How can Ottawa residents 
trust a government that promises an increase in tests one day while their officials are issuing secret directives to scale them back the next? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And with your indulgence, I will repeat that we did not know about this memo that was sent out. This was not approved by my office, and that this is something that Ontario Health is going to be clarifying with a further memo after they've had discussions with our office. But we have been clear from the very beginning that everyone who needs a test will be given a test. That has not changed and will not change. What we have done is substantially increased our testing volumes to the point that over several days last week we were doing over 40,000 tests per day across the province of Ontario. That is a significant increase from what we started from, and we've at the same time been boosting our lab capacity to do the same thing. We are well on track to reach the level of 50,000 tests that we can do within the next very short period of time. But what we also Spons? indicated last week was if you are asymptomatic, you can be tested. If you need to be, if you're working with long-term care patients or you need it to go back to work, you can be tested at pharmacies or at assessment centers. But that level of testing is going to continue and anyone who needs Thank you very much. The supplementary question. The member for Ottawa South. Thank you, Speaker. It's hard for families waiting or unable to get a test to understand how we find ourselves here. When the government had the time and the money, and we knew that a second wave was imminent, we knew that two million kids were going back to school, and yet we find ourselves in this situation where we can't build up testing capacity fast enough to meet demand, and there's serious testing backlogs and confusing messaging around who can get a test. It seems to me the government's priority this summer was the Premier's tour. Instead of preparing for a safe return to school or expanding testing and contact tracing, or at the very least, better management of the lab capacity that we do have. Speaker, it is a flat-footed response. So through you to the Premier, why is it that we find ourselves so Question. woefully unprepared for the second wave of COVID-19? Minister of Health. Thank you. In fact, quite the opposite is the case. We have been prepared for a long period of time for a second wave of COVID-19. We started working on this in the early summer and been working on it consistently ever since. The result is our plan that we have been uh, indicating to the people of Ontario and as well to the members on the opposite side, which takes into account all of the relevant factors in dealing with the second wave. The numbers increasing, the flu coming on at the same time as a potential second wave, the increasing in the number of test volumes that, that we need to do, dealing with the uh, fact that so many patients have been decanted or residents from long-term care homes into hospitals for infection prevention and control, and working on the backlogs of surgeries and procedures that were postponed during wave one. All of these things have been what? taken into consideration, have been planned for, and are being implemented not only with the plan, but with a significant infusion of cash, including a billion dollars to supplement and implement our testing, tracing, and isolation policy. To Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. This COVID period has been such a challenge for all of us, but especially for our small business and particularly Northern small businesses that have been hit hard during the COVID-19 pandemic. And while we commend those businesses that have been able to adapt and overcome in these unprecedented challenges of the past seven months, can the minister please tell us what our government is doing to support our northern small businesses. Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Brantford Brant for his important question. Yesterday I stood shoulder to shoulder with my progressive conservative northern colleagues, Mr. Speaker, to announce the Northern Ontario Recovery Program. Now, this is a targeted investment, an allocation of $20 million that provides up to $25,000 in grants for small businesses across uh, Northern Ontario to adapt to the changing circumstances that COVID has from its outset presented small businesses. Mr. Speaker, we're very proud of this announcement 
And we thank the Chambers of Commerce. We thank businesses for extent during the extensive stakeholder engagement that we made over the course of summer that we're pleased to offer this program, effective October 1st, Mr. Speaker, backdating to March 24th, 2020, for the real changes and adaptations that businesses made and will continue to, to make in the face of COVID. Charla Robinson, the Ch Thunder Response. Bay Chamber of Commerce, greatly appreciated the support offered by the program, especially for those businesses in retail, tourism, and restaurants, Mr. Speaker. We're proud to support Northern Ontario businesses. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. And back to you. It's clear that our government is listening to the people of Northern Ontario and responding to their unique needs. Can the minister please share more details of the program and the type of projects that it aims to support? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a comprehensive plan that we received feedback from from businesses across Northern Ontario. Some of the things that we were thinking about were building renovations to support physical distancing, proposing to municipalities a better shopping and dining street in their towns, many of them small towns, Mr. Speaker. We tried that out in Kenora and we found out that small businesses needed new furniture and new appliances to make that work. Uh, tourist camp operators are going to need larger docks, Mr. Speaker, in an effort to keep tourist parties uh, separate. There's in, in equipment purchases, including PPE, and marketing and technology platforms, Mr. Speaker, especially for retail, potentially meet, meeting uh, a new market. Mr. Speaker, the value proposition, we believe, goes beyond COVID. These fixes uh, and these adjustments that have been done and will continue to be done um, we're certainly uh, related to COVID, Mr. Speaker, but, but at the end, it's a business enhancement. A better technology Months? platform or a marketing initiative is good for Northern Ontario business. That's what we heard from over 400 people who attended the Zoom announcement yesterday. The next question, the member for Nickelbell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is for the Minister of Soins de Longue Durée. Speaker, last week, in response to my question about personal protective equipment, the Minister stated, and I quote, we need to deal with the facts. And the fact is that our long-term care home in Ontario are receiving the PPE they need. They have the PPE they require, including N95." End of quote. Minister, you've seen the letter dated September 22nd from the chair of St. Joseph Villa and La Villa Saint-Gabriel. They wrote, since the onset of the pandemic, both of our 128-bed long-term care homes have been desperately trying to acquire N95 masks for our facility with no success. We have contacted the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Long-Term Care, pleading for their assistance to secure these masks for our facility." End of quote. Minister, yeah. how can you explain the dif disconnect between your statement in this House and the fact that long-term care homes still cannot access the PPE they need to keep their staff and residents safe? Mr. Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. It is a very important question because our government has been committed to the safety and well being of residents and staff uh, during Wave 1 and as we continue to plan into, into Wave 2. PPE is an absolute uh, essential. And our homes are receiving uh, PPE supplies, uh, including N95s. But there is a difference between the homes that are in outbreak, um, needing N95s, versus homes that are not in outbreak. Uh, and we want to make sure that the homes that are in outbreak are receiving the N95s they need. We are endeavouring to make sure that every home in Ontario, every long-term care home, has has the supply, the PPE supply that it needs, whether it's N95s, whether it's gloves, gowns, surgical masks, face shields, we are making sure that they have what is needed. And there will be more, um, more this week on that. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, we are currently in the second wave, six months since the declaration of the pandemic and our long-term care home still cannot get the PPE they need from this government. The government policies to wait until a home is in outbreak to release N95 completely ignores the basic principle of infection control. Long-term care homes require an inventory of PPE on hand to ensure they are ready. Long-term care homes cannot wait until they are in outbreak to be rationed N95 from Ontario Health or the Lins or the Norton Supply Chain or the back of the Premier's truck. Uh, they need to be ready, and that means they need an inventory on site. Can the minister please advise the House when she expects 
every Ontario long-term care, including St. Joseph Villa and Villa St. Gabriel in my riding, will have the needed inventory of PPE, including N95 and P100, on hand. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again. I, I, I refute the assertion that the homes do not have the PPE supply that they need. It is absolutely accurate to state that the homes have the Order. PPE that Order. they need at this time. Given the, uh, the previous procurement problems, the global competition, uh, and the problems associated with that, we were making sure that PPE supplies got to the homes and so that homes were not left without because more PPE supply went to another. We had to be um, fair and distribute the, the, the uh, um, uh, PPE that we had. Now, the procurement process is much better. Ontario has its ability to be um, independent on its supply of, of masks, of N95s, and other aspects. So that is a significant change. And I'm going to tell you that imminently you Response. will be hearing about the, the advanced supply that our homes across Ontario will have. I thank you for raising the question. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Rowan Stringer was a 17-year-old varsity rugby player in Ottawa. She passed away after sustaining multiple concussions, resulting in catastrophic brain injury. Through you, Speaker. Minister, the legacy of Rowan Stringer lives on through Rowan's Law, something you fought alongside uh, Rowan's parents, Kathleen and Gordon Stringer, for during your time in opposition. Rowan's Law, Speaker, ensures that Ontario's athletes are protected and treated as soon as there is a suspicion of a concussion, a measure that will undoubtedly save lives. However, it is the country's first and only concussion legislation. Through you, Speaker. Minister, concussions are a concern for almost all sports. What is the ministry doing to uh, spread the word on the importance of concussion legislation so other regions across the country can do their part and protect their athletes? Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture. Uh, th thank you very much, Speaker. And I'd like to say thank you to the member from Willowdale uh, for his question and also for his advocacy. It was a year ago when he and the member from Barry Innisfil and the member from Durham all helped me uh, kick off Rowan's, day, Rowan's Law Day as my first as the minister here. I'd also be remiss if I did not say thank you to the members from Waterloo and Ottawa South for their unwavering support and commitment to Rowan's Law. Uh, we truly, I think, made uh, a really formidable team in the true sense of the word. And and uh, I, I couldn't be more pleased to be here today as the minister responsible, but also the originator of this legislation. So uh, last Friday, we were at Rowan's pitch to announce that Ontario will lead a national discussion at the next federal, provincial, territorial meeting of sports ministers, and we'll continue to have that conversation. Today, Minister Walker is in his constituency announcing $25,000 to help with rural concussions with the Brain Resource Centre in his community. And we're working tomorrow with the Rowan's Law Working Group and my amateur sport panel to bring everyone together to have a broader discussion on concussion and the effects on mental health um, with the minister. Um, tomorrow, we're going to have a great announcement. We're looking forward to it. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and through you, Minister, thank you uh, for everything that you've done to have Rowan's legacy live on, not only in Ontario, but in our entire country. Speaker, concussions can happen to anyone taking part in sport and recreation, and some, sometimes they can have very serious consequences. The highest rates of concussion in Ontario, in fact, Speaker, are found among children and youth under the age of 18. That's why it's so important to ensure that concussions are diagnosed and treated correctly. Speaker, through you, Minister, can you speak to some of Ontario's activities to date that have helped bring awareness to Canada's first concussion uh, safety legislation? Mr. Heritage. For that supplemental, obviously, it's important that as we look in a COVID-19 environment, what a safe return to play looks like. It's important to learn the lessons that we did from our our discussions in this province with respect to concussion awareness, and we are going to continue to build on that. As I said, with the Minister of uh, Associate Minister of Mental Health uh, later tomorrow. Um, since the uh, Rowan's Law was uh, committed to by this legislature and through the previous ministries, uh, we have uh, uh, invested $130,000 into the Canadian Concussion Legacy Foundation. Over 35. 
$5,000 to Coaches Ontario, over $600,000 into the development of concussion awareness resources and templates, and over $25,000 to support Special Olympians. Speaker, this is a very important issue. A young brain um, cannot be covered with a cast. It does have long-standing effects long after life, and as we saw with little Roe, um, after sustaining multiple concussions, she fatally uh, met, uh, met a, a circumstance that her parents will probably never get over. Thank you, Speaker, for the opportunity to address this. Next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Small and medium-sized businesses are relying on the government to keep them afloat during the pandemic. This is especially true in the arts and culture sector, where women face historic barriers and a disproportionate negative impact from the required shutdowns in our communities. Tammy Lawrence, a successful business owner in Kitchener Centre, lost her live performance venue, Rhapsody Barrel Bar, during the pandemic. Tammy explained that she couldn't afford any more debt, and four months of rent relief just wasn't enough to save her business. Like many business owners, COVID-19 took her business out. She lost her livelihood, musicians that graced the Rhapsody stage lost their income, and the community at large has now lost a cultural gem. With the second wave upon us, businesses like hers are still struggling. And so my question is to the Premier. Will this government help businesses like Rhapsody avoid closure through tangible supports like emergency commercial rent subsidies, freezing utility bills, and banning all evictions during the entire duration of this pandemic? The Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you to the member opposite for that question. It's a very important question. So many uh, people within the sectors that I represent um, are women, and uh, they have been hit hardest first, uh, of course, in this pandemic. And as my colleagues, I think, are probably tired of hearing me say, we will be the longest to recover, which is why in our sectors I created immediately 14 ministerial advisory committees in order to address the various parts of uh, this ministry and, and what the economic impact would be. Uh, we believe we've lost about $20 billion in the first uh, phase of this pandemic, and that's why it's extremely important to act on these recommendations. I've been pleased to work with the cultural sector in addition to investing uh, $7 million into the Music Investment Fund in the province of Ontario. Yesterday, we had another additional uh, investment of $1.3 million to support the cultural sectors. We're going to continue to roll out this funding. We believe that these cultural sectors are going to be incredibly important Response. for the economic recovery, the social recovery of this province in the next 18 months. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. We're, we are in the midst of a, sea, of a she session. More women than men are losing jobs. In my riding of Kitchener Centre, we are seeing successful businesses owned and operated by women closing because of the pressures of COVID-19. Another successful live performance venue, The Cossary, run by Stephanie Rozak and CJ Perez, female business owners in my riding, also had to close their doors. And this is no coincidence. Three strong women running cultural hubs in Waterloo Region have been forced to close their doors. Women have a long history of glass ceilings and financial barriers when it comes to succeeding in the business world. And Stephanie told my office that she took out extensive personal debt to underwrite the business and was at the point of just being able to start her repayments when the space was forced to close because of COVID-19. Question. With the right support, this could have been prevented. So again, I ask the Premier if he can guarantee that as the second wave is upon us, business owners who are faced with historic barriers will have the proper support that they need to keep their doors open. Minister of Heritage, reply. Thanks. Another excellent question, Speaker. We're all seeing it in one of our communities, which is why I think it's really important that we look at the cultural fabric that these uh, institutions bring to our communities, including the businesses, as well as the, the importance that they have in, our, in terms of our economy. And I think we're seeing that fragility now. I want to assure the member opposite. I am working with the Associate Minister of Women's Issues to see how we can best address this within the sectors that I represent. In particular, I want to talk about music venues, which you talked about, and cultural venues. We know it's going to be very difficult, not only that if we open them, getting people back and comfortable getting back into that circumstance and the consumer uh, behaviors and habits. It's what keeps me up at night, but I assure you it keeps me up. It gets me up in the morning working with these sectors. I would invite the member opposite and her constituents to, to participate on Friday with a telephone town hall with the ministry and myself as we can talk through and navigate these tough waters Response. together. But I am very grateful that she brought this important issue to the floor of the Assembly because we are dealing with a triple threat, a health care threat. A Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. 
My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. With the rollout of our government's forestry forest sector strategy and the recent passage of the, the 100th anniversary of forestry, people are keen to hear what concrete steps our government is taking to support forestry in this province. I know that the strategy is comprehensive and is built around four pillars, promoting stewardship and sustainability, putting more wood to work, improving cost competitiveness, and fostering innovations, markets, and talent. Minister, for many years, the previous government paid only lip service for support for rural and northern Ontario industries like forestry. But we Conservatives are different. We deliver. Could the minister please tell us how we are acting on the principles laid out in this strategy? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you much, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Stormont Dundas, South Lingari, for that uh, great question. Our government is all about improving the conditions on the ground so that Ontarians can create jobs and innovate. Last week, along with my colleagues, Ministers Hardiman, Fideli, and my parliamentary assistant, Mike Harris, I was proud to announce that we are providing $2 million of investment in the wood products company Oxford Pallet. With this funding, they'll be able to expand their operations, introduce innovative robotic and vision equipment to boost productivity and create local jobs. Investments like these are absolutely critical to support the province's vital forestry sector and start us down the road to a strong economic recovery. I'll have more to say in the, su in the supplementary speaker, but what a great business Oxford Pallet is. Unbelievable people. We'll tell you more in the supplementary. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. It's so good to see that only a few weeks ago after the rollout of the strategy, we are taking concrete action to implement it and create jobs and prosperity in this province. I understand that Oxford Pallet is the first company to be approved for funding under the Forest Sector Investment and Innovative Program, Innovation Program, a program designed to help Ontario forestry companies develop and impl implement innovative technology. And it's important to be innovative from the perspective of business competitiveness and job creation, but equally important is the role of innovation on sustainability. Minister, do investments like these just improve the bottom line, or do they improve the sustainability of the forest industry as well? Natural resources and forest. Thank, you, Speaker. Thank you to the member for that follow-up question. As I said, that at Oxford Pallet, this investment will create 20 new jobs, continue uh, to provide the 60 jobs that they currently have, and double their production, as well as it will they will increase the amount of uh, Ontario lumber used by 30 per cent as a result of this investment. But I want to tell you a little more about the, the people. Hank Vruchtevien and his family are salt of the earth. And I'm going to tell you, we had a tour of that plant. He knew every one of those employees by name, and you could understand and see the commitment they had to that job and that company. It's like one big family affair. Those are the kinds of businesses in this province that our government wants to support. They'll be around for a long time. They care about their employees, they care about this province, and they want to help us put Ontario back on that road to recovery. Thank you very much. Next question, member for Toronto, Danforth. Uh, thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. On Sunday, the French language school, La Mosaïque, in my riding, sent a letter to parents saying that one whole class was going to be shut down until October 5th because of COVID. Of course, they're not the only parents to get a letter from their school saying that their kids had to stay away. Yesterday, my colleague, the member for Davenport, noted many other cases. Your education minister told this House that all was being looked after. He told reporters yesterday that he would do whatever it takes to keep our children safe and our schools open. And he said the same on August 26, September 9, September 21, etc. And yet, he won't cap class sizes at 15, a key step to reducing risk in our schools. So, Premier, how many schools have to shut down before you do whatever it takes and cap class sizes at 15 to protect our children and our families from COVID? Minister of Education. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, we've been clear, as is the Chief Medical Officer of Health, that the risk within our communities will create challenges within our schools. It's the basis for why the Minister of Health, the Deputy Premier, the Premier of this province has unveiled a significant investment in public health to reduce transmission in community, to increase immunization to more students, 700,000 more people being able to access the flu, expanding testing, expanding contact tracing within our school speakers specifically. We've ensured every layer of prevention is in place. Additional, te additional teachers are hired to increase distancing, additional custodians to enhance cleaning, more public health nurses to administer screening uh, and symptom relief. In fact, we've more than doubled public health nurses in schools. And in every school board, we're seeing net reductions in classroom size. It's a demonstration, Speaker, that our investments are reaching our front lines, and we are grateful for everyone working with us in this unprecedented challenge to reduce the risk and keep our kids safe. And a supplementary question. Speaker, again to the Premier, you know it's not working, right? It's just not working. That's right. It's not just that the students at La, La Mosique have to stay home and deal with the virus. It's not just that their parents have to stay home, look after them and lose work. It's not just that teachers and education workers will have to stay home from their work. It's also the case that the children should be tested and the parents and the children have to go through the ordeal of waiting to get a test. Our local testing facility is at Michael Guerin Hospital and testing can take hours and hours of waiting to get. As one parent wrote to me, who had been in the line with her child <clears throat> for five hours, quote, do you know what it's like to wait in a line like that with young kids? I saw so many parents in tears in that line, stressed to the max, overwhelmed by all of this. I ask again, Premier, how many schools have to shut down before you actually do whatever it takes to protect parents and children. And again, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, we have committed ourselves to follow a, a health and safety protocol that's been informed and endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Speaker, we've put in place a variety of layers of prevention to mitigate risk. And, Speaker, what I can tell you is that the Chief Medical Officer is in constant contact with our public health units. Just this morning, we had another call with leaders in Windsor, Essex, to talk to our school boards, our public health leaders, and the head of nursing to ensure that the protocol is being benchmarked, that is being, uh, you know, improved over time, that ultimately is working. What I I can tell you overwhelmingly is that on the ground the outbreak protocols are being well managed public health nurses are on site testing is being provided. in fact mobile testing is, is being sent to some schools in this province according to the public health units and speaker we're ensuring that the training is in place for our educators that they know how to respond when these challenges arise. Speaker, we are fully committed Response. to ensuring our schools are safe. We have more investments coming that will further ensure the safety of schools, the safety of kids. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. There being no further business, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.